Good evening. I've been having a lot of letters about the very brilliant object in the eastern sky before dawn. That, in fact, is the planet Venus, and there's a recent sketch I made of it. Any binoculars will now show the crescent form. The other planet well on view is Mars, this time in the evening sky, and there's a sketch of it. Note the ice cap in the north at the bottom of the disk there. But I want to turn now to something much further away. This is a spiral galaxy, the galaxy Messier 100. In the constellation of Coma, not very far away from the Great Bear, although, of course, you won't see it with the naked eye. It's far too faint for that. It's rather a loose spiral that's been very much in the news recently because we have a new measurement of its distance. It turns out to be 51 million light years away. Now, one light year is the distance travelled by a ray of light in one year, nearly 6 million million miles. And so the distance of MI100 is something like 300 million 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 miles, which is quite some way. It's in what we call the Virgo Cluster. That's a group of galaxies way beyond our own. And like all other clusters, in, uh, clusters of galaxies, this one is moving away from us. The entire universe is expanding. Now, this new measurement has been made by means of the Hubble Space Telescope. This has been done by using very interesting stars known as Cepheid variables. Now, most stars, including the Sun, shine steadily for year after year, century after century. But Cepheid variables don't. They brighten and fade over short periods. And the way in which they behave tells us how luminous they really are. And of course, if you know how luminous a star really is, and also how bright it looks, then you can tell how far away it is. And the Hubble telescope has now measured sea field variables inside M100 and given the distance of 51 million light years. We also know how fast it's going away. And this tells us how long the expansion of the universe has been going on. And here is the rub. If this new measurement is right, it means that the universe can't be more than 12,000 million years old, and it's probably rather less. But we have excellent evidence that some stars are older than that, and you can't have stars which are older than the universe. So something is wrong somewhere. It all hinges upon what we call the Hubble constant, abbreviated H0. And this governs the way, the rate at which the universe is expanding. And at this stage, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Sean Hughes of the Royal Observatories, who has been very much involved in this new research. First of all, Sean, will you tell us something about HO, the Hubble constant? Well, in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble, an American astronomer, first noted that the more distant a galaxy appeared to be, the faster it seemed to be receding away from us. And when we plot this up in this so-called Hubble diagram, you can see there's a fairly linear relation between the two. And the ratio of the velocities to distance is, in fact, the Hubble constant. Now, knowing an accurate value of the Hubble constant is very handy indeed. In cosmological theories, it's required for, to determine the density of the universe and the age of the universe. And from an observational point of view, it's also extremely important because just by measuring a galaxy's recessional velocity, we can then determine its distance. Uh, and measuring distances in astronomy is a rather difficult thing to do. <coughs> However, to determine an accurate value of H0, you need to know distances to, to at least the nearby galaxies. And measuring distances in astronomy is very difficult. Uh, for the very nearby stars, we can measure direct distances by the method of parallax. Now, this uses the fact that the Earth, here shown here in blue, against, which is orbiting the Sun in yellow there, can, can look at the nearby stars against uh, background stars, measure their position against those stars, and then six months later, the Earth has orbited the Sun and is now looking at the star from a slightly different position. We can measure that position for the nearby stars and by looking at the difference to how the star has moved, we can measure the angular distance. And because we know the distance from the Earth to the Sun, we can then use simple trigonometry to determine what the distance of the star is. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> in terms of parallax, we measure angles in units of arc seconds. Now, an arc second is an extremely small measurement. Um, for instance, the uh, diameter of the Moon is half a degree, which is equivalent to, say, a 10 penny piece at a distance of 10 feet whereas a second of arc is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree and is equivalent to a ten penny piece at a distance of three and a quarter miles. So it's rather small. Now a star with a parallax of one arc second may, would be at a distance of one parsec, and one parsec is about 3.26 light years. <coughs> but currently we can only measure stars, uh, the nearest stars using parallax, and that's about 10,000 stars. To go beyond that, we have to use uh, methods using standard candles, such as uh, one favorite method is using Cepheid variables. 
Now, the way standard candle method works is that you know the intrinsic brightness of one particular object. You then find another object which is similar to it and assume that it has the same brightness. So that if you have two candles, for instance, side by side, when one of those candles is, in fact, mo more distant, it will be appear fainter than the nearer candle. So the difference in brightness between the two candles will then allow you to estimate the distance between the candles. Uh, in this way, because we know what the intrinsic brightness of the Cepheids are once we measure their periods, we can then measure the relative distances between Cepheids. And we've used Cepheids to measure distances to our nearby galaxies. But the problem is that uh, because of the burying effects of the atmosphere, you can only uh, go so far. To go beyond the nearest galaxies, you have to use the Hubble Space Telescope uh, because it's well above the Earth's atmosphere, and so we can then resolve stars at a much greater distance and hence identify the Cepheids. Which, of course, you can't do from ground level. That's right. And uh, in the case of M100, here is an image taken from the ground of M100 by David Malin. And although you can see uh, quite a bit of detail there, you actually can't identify individual stars. Now, if you take a blow-up of a ground-based image, all you'll see is a lot of fuzz. Yeah. There are no stars at all. However, using the repaired Hubble Space Telescope, we're able to observe all the bright stars in M100. And in fact, uh, some of the stars that are as bright as the Cepheids we've detected are labeled here, the arrows. Now, in order to detect Cepheids in M100, we take a series of pictures of a particular field, the same field, which is slightly off to one side, over a 60-day period. In fact, we took about 12 exposures of the same field. And that gave us about 40,000 stars. And from those 40,000 stars, we're able to detect variables. Here is one of the brighter variables off to one side. And as you can see, it's varying in brightness. Now, we correlate those uh, each variation in brightness with the time at which it was taken. And this allows us to build up a light curve of that Cepheid. And when you plot the light curve, you can see that it varies in a very characteristic manner and allows us to determine its period. Once we've measured the period, we then know what its true intrinsic brightness is. We compare that to the brightness determined from HST, and that gives us the distance to M100. Up to now, why has the value of the Hubble constant been so uncertain? The main problem is that we can only go so far from the ground, and it, we had to wait until we had the Hubble Space Telescope before we could go to more distant galaxies. Uh, the reason why this is a problem is because although galaxies are expanding due to the ex Big Bang and the expansion of the universe, they're also affected by their near neighbors, and this adds an extra component due to the gravitational interaction between them. This is around about 200 kilometers per second, typically. And in order to move, we can either try and account for that peculiar motion, which means we have to measure all the mass within near, near each galaxy. This is difficult because most of the matter in the universe seems to be dark, at least 90% uh, of it. Uh, so the other alternative is to move to galaxies that are sufficiently far away whereby their peculiar velocities are no longer important. And this is at and beyond the Virgo cluster. You know, one thing strikes me, the fact that we can make any attempt at all to measure the Hubble constant does seem to give support to the, the Big Bang theory. You know, the theory that everything, space, time, matter, everything else, came into existence at one set moment a long time ago. That's right. The concept of the Big Bang is that right when time itself started, everything else was created. And it started off as being very hot and very dense. And as it expanded, the temperature and the density fell until about 100 million years or so after the Big Bang event. The galaxies were able to form and, and still expanding away until we get to today's epoch, whereby we're able to measure that expansion rate at which the measure how fast the galaxies are moving away from each other. We can measure now the distances to the nearby galaxies. And dividing one by the other gives us the expansion rate. By running that backwards in time, as it were, we can then determine when the Big Bang event occurred. Well, let's try and sum up for a minute, can we? We know that the universe is expanding, and the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's going away from us. And this comes back again to the Hubble constant. Now, the Hubble constant is measured in terms of kilometers per second per megaparsec, a megaparsec being one million parsecs, and the parsec being 3.26 light years.
And values have been very diverse. I mean, for example, one value, I think, was 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and that was rather low. And a low value of the Hubble constant indicates that the universe is old, with the expansion been going on for a long time, and a higher value indicates that the universe is much younger. Now, these new determinations from the M100 seem to indicate that the real value is something like 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's higher than has been believed, therefore the universe is younger, and that does cause problems. But how sure can you be that these new determinations are correct? Well, we basically can use two methods to derive H0 from distance to M100. Uh, the first is the very simple method of simply dividing the recession velocity of the Virgo cluster by the distance to M100. The problem with this is that uh, because the Virgo cluster is very populous, as you see here, it's almost covered in with galaxies, uh, the peculiar motions are rather high. Yes. And so that adds a rather large uncertainty on the value. But in, in any case, the value we get is around 80. However, we can reduce that uncertainty by using the distance to M100 to calibrate secondary distance indicators. Now, these secondary distance indicators are a way of determining distances to galaxies well beyond Virgo by using such properties as the, uh, t by measuring the velocities within a, a galaxy to measure its total mass and hence its total luminosity, or by measuring individual bright objects within the galaxy which gives us its total luminosity and hence this distance. Now, the thing about these secondary distance indicators is that they all seem to agree. They all give the correct relative distances to galaxies beyond Virgo. The problem has been we haven't got a good calibration for these. So we can use the distance to M100 as a good indicator of the distance to Virgo and hence calibrate these secondary distance indicators. Now, in the days of Hubble, he was able to measure the distances to uh, about a dozen galaxies and measure which went out to distances that had velocities around 1,000 kilometers per second. These secondary distance indicators allow us to go out to velocities well beyond that and up to distances of over 10,000 kilometers per second. What we're aiming to do is to calibrate the second distance indicators with the M100 distance. And that also gives us a value of around 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But because uh, the Virgo cluster is rather extended, we're not very certain of the distance to the Virgo cluster itself. So the actual value of H0 lies somewhere between 50 and 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But the most likely value is 80. Well, it all seems to fit, doesn't it? But let's turn now, Cammy, to the ages of the stars. And here we have at least something to guide us, because we know the age of the Earth fairly precisely. It's about 4.6 thousand million years, and since the planets were formed from a cloud of material around the Sun, clearly the Sun is older than that. And yet, we are fairly sure that there are many stars which are much older than the Sun. Yes, that's true. Stellar evolution tells us that um, metals heavier than lithium had to have been produced in stars. And in the Sun, we can observe these more massive metals. And on the Earth, we can uh, mine such useful elements as iron and uh, carbon and silicon, for which we can build useful things such as telescopes. Uh, that tells us that the Sun and the solar system had to have been produced by at least one generation of previous stars. Now, uh, a, star, a star of about the Sun's mass will eventually become a red giant and form a planetary nebula. Here's a very famous picture of the Helix Nebula taken by David Malin. And uh, more massive stars in the Sun uh, will eventually become supernovae. One such star is in the uh, Carina Nebula, which is about 50 solar masses. It will certainly become a supernova. And when it does, you'll see the remnant. And here's a picture of the Crab Nebula. And a similar picture remnant is the uh, Vela Nebula. From these supernova explosions, the metals produced in those will then recondense into stars from which presumably the Sun had formed. However, there are also uh, other stars in our galaxy which are believed to be even older than the Sun and are at least around 14,000 million years old. Well, that's all very curious indeed. Do you think there's any chance that our estimates of stellar ages are completely wrong? Well, it's certainly true that we cannot completely describe uh, the nearest star being our Sun. For the most uh, obvious example being uh, the paucity of solar neutrinos. These are produced in the nuclear reactions in the very centre of the Sun. And uh, there are too few uh, to agree with the current theories. Uh, however, if you talk to a stellar evolutionist, they'll tell you that the, um, the lowest age that they can put on the oldest stars in our galaxy is around about 12,000 million years. And this is, in fact, 
uh, still older than the age of the universe determined by H0, which is around about 8,000 million years, which puts us back, in other words, the ages of the stars are still older than the Big Bang. So we have a problem. It seems that either our estimates of the ages of the stars are wrong, or else we're wrong in giving the Hubble constant a value of something like 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec. They can't both be right. What do you think is the answer, Sean? Well, I suspect the answer lies in the theory of the Big Bang itself. Um, although theorists like to have a high density of the universe, uh, observationally there's no evidence for it. And if you plot the allowed values of H0 and the allowed values of the density, you get a box that looks a bit like this. H0 ranging from 70 to 100 and the density from 0.1 to 1. Now, if you put up the lowest age of the oldest star in our galaxy, you can see that the two areas intersect at a low density. So that's one solution. Alternatively, we go back to Einstein's original theory and introduce the cosmological constant, uh, which would then allow us to have both a high density universe, a high value for H0 and an old age. Well, it's a fascinating problem. On the one hand, we have evidence that some stars are more than 14,000 million years old. On another, the universe can't be more than 12,000 million years old. And quite clearly, something is wrong somewhere. I'm quite sure we're going to solve it before very long. But meanwhile, I think it's fair to say that cosmology is in something of a crisis. Sean, thank you very much. Now, don't forget, it's newsletter time. If you want the latest newsletter, then send your standard rest envelope to newsletter number 56, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W127TS, or of course CFAX page 615, or you can dial up the Sky at Night information line 0891 800 When I come back next month, we're going to return to the solar system and talk about those fascinating new objects right from the Kuiper belt. Good night.